Hello, this is Andy from the Engineers Academy, and in this video we're going to begin looking at probability. Now there's two different types of probability that we're going to be looking at. First of all, in this video we're going to be looking at binomial probability, and in the next video we're going to look at normal distributions. Now for binomial probability, the easiest way to think of this is the probability of an event happening and the probability of an event not happening. So I've got some examples there. If you imagine you flip a coin, then there's only two outcomes. One outcome is that you get a head, and the second outcome is that you don't get a head or you get a tail. We can also relate that to a six-sided dice. If we want to roll a six on a dice, then there's only two outcomes. The first outcome is that we roll a six, and the second outcome is that we don't roll a six. And in the brackets there, we've got one, two, three, four, and five but we've clustered those outcomes together and called it a not six. Now where this fits in with engineering is that when we consider whether a component is defective or non-defective, there's only two outcomes. Either the component is defective and is not fit for purpose, or it's non-defective and it is fit for purpose. Now the last thing that's worth mentioning here before we look at some specific examples is that we have two types of events. We have independent events and we have dependent events. In this video, we're going to look at independent events, and basically what an independent event is, is where when an activity happens or when an event happens, it doesn't influence any subsequent events. If we use the example of flipping a coin, if I flip a coin and I get a head, when I flip that coin for a second time, the outcome of that first event doesn't influence the outcome of the second event. As a second example, if I roll a dice and I get a six, it then makes no difference when I repeat the roll of the dice, the outcome of that first event. So let's begin with a nice straightforward example of flipping a coin multiple times. Okay, so when I flip that coin for the first time, I have the possibility of getting a head and I have the possibility of getting a tail or a not head. Now assuming that this is a regular coin, the chance of each of those things happening is 50-50. But the important thing with binomial probabilities is that the outcomes must add up to 1. So the probability that I get ahead is 0.5. And the probability that I get a tail is also 0.5. So there's a 50-50 chance of getting ahead and a 50-50 chance of getting a tail. Where things become a little more interesting is when we consider the second flip of a coin. So for the second flip, because these events are independent, once again the likelihood that I get a head is 0.5 and the likelihood that I get a tail is 0.5. But from the previous flip we already had two possible outcomes. We had the possibility of getting a head and we had the possibility of getting a tail. So already we have an opportunity to have got a head and a head. We have the possibility to have got a tail and a tail. And I'll just add this on the next branch here. The possibility of getting a tail and a tail can be seen here and here. And there is a third outcome, we could get a head and a tail. Let's add our probabilities to these second branches. Here we have 0.5, here we have 0.5, and again underneath 0.5 and 0.5. So here we can start to consider the possibility of getting two heads, two tails, plus a head and a tail. And the way that we normally do this is we highlight the branches. So let's say, for example, we were looking for the likelihood of getting two heads a head and a head. Well, we can see from our diagram that there's only one opportunity for that to happen. We have this branch here and we have this branch here. Now, the important thing to remember is that when we go along branches, we need to multiply. So if we go along a branch like so, then we need to multiply those two probabilities together. So the probability of getting a head and a head is 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 which is 0.25. Now, we can also consider the likelihood of getting a tail because, again, we can highlight our branches, and I'll just switch colours for this. The likelihood of getting a tail and a tail, we can see that there's only one pair of branches, 
that matches that outcome. And it's this branch. This is getting a tail on the first flip. And this branch is getting a tail on the second flip. Now, as we just said, as we move along the branches, we need to multiply. So the probability of getting a tail and a tail is 0.5 times 0.5, which equals 0.25. As we would expect, there's exactly the same likelihood of getting two heads as there is of getting two tails because the probability of getting a head and a tail was the same. So now we come on to the question of what is the likelihood of getting one head and one tail? And what we need to do is refer to our diagram because what we can see is that the likelihood of getting a head on the first flip is a half. But if we want to get a head and a tail, we would then need to get a tail on our second flip. So head on first flip, tail on second flip. And the likelihood of that happening, multiplying along the branches, is 0.5 times 0.5 which is 0.25. But we can see that there is another possible way of getting one head and one tail, and that's to flip the tail first and then the head second. So to get a tail first and a head second is these two branches here, and the probability is going to be exactly the same, 0.5 times 0.5 equals 0.25. But what we notice here is that the likelihood of getting a head and a tail is greater than the likelihood of getting two heads. And we can also see that the likelihood of getting a head and a tail is greater than the likelihood of getting two tails because there's two branches that match that outcome. So what we need to do in this instance is we need to add these two probabilities together. So when there's multiple events at the end of the branches that match our criteria, we need to add. So here we would be adding outcomes. So the probability of getting one head and one tail, note that we're not specifying the order, but the probability of getting a one times a head and a one times a tail is just going to be a quarter plus a quarter which is a half. So we see here that it's important to consider whether there's more than one way of achieving our outcome. The other thing that's really important to note is that all of our outcomes will still add up to one. So we've got 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25 and 0.25. All of those outcomes will always add up to one. Okay, let's look at a second example. And in this example, we're going to consider rolling a six-sided dice. And the first thing we're going to do is find out the probability that we get three sixes in a row. So first of all, if we add our possible outcomes to our branches, and on the first roll, we can either get a six, or we can get a one through five, one, two, three, four, or five. On our second event, we can get the same. We can either get a six or we can get a one to five. And on our third event or our third roll of the dice, we have exactly the same outcomes. Now the probability of rolling a six, and we'll keep this as a fraction, the probability of rolling a six is one sixth. 1 in 6. And the probability of getting a 1, 2, 3, 4 or 5 is 5 in 6. Now one of the things you'll notice again is that these must add up to 1. So if we've got a 6 plus 5, 6, then that adds up to 1. There's no other possible outcome. It's either a 6 or it's not a 6. Now we can repeat that on our next branch. We have a sixth and five sixths, a sixth and five sixths, and we can also add that to our third event or our third roll of the dice. A sixth, five sixths, and so on down the column. So the probability of rolling three sixes as we inspect these branches, we can see that there's only one possible branch because when we roll the dice for the first time, 
the probability that we get a 6 is this branch here. When we roll the second dice, assuming that we've rolled a 6 on the first dice, the only two opportunities then are this root here and this root here. Well, we don't want to take the bottom root because that's rolling a 1, 2, 3, 4 or 5. So our only option there is this branch. And for the same reason, when we come on to our third event, we can't go down this way because we don't want a 1, 2, 3, 4 or 5. So we have to go along this branch here. So our probability of rolling a 6 three times in a row is found by doing the following. We've got a 6 times a 6 times a 6. Now if you run that through your calculator, you get an answer of 0 0.004463. Now another way of writing this, because the probability of each event is the same, is we could just do a sixth cubed, because a sixth times a sixth times a sixth is a sixth cubed. And you can check this on your calculators, but you'll get the same answer of 0 0.00463. But if we were to change things a little bit, let's say, for example, we wanted to find the probability that we roll just one six. So the probability of rolling just one six, well, first of all, that six could be rolled on the first dice. So we have this branch here. But if we roll a six on the first dice, then on the second and third dice, we mustn't roll a six. OK, so we have this branch here and we have this branch here. So here we see that the probability of rolling one six, where the six is on the first roll, we can multiply them probabilities. So we have a six times five six times five six. Now that's the same as saying a six times five six squared. And when we run that sum through our calculators, we get an answer of 0 0.11574. But here's the important thing. I haven't specified that that six has to be rolled on the first dice. So we actually have another way of achieving that outcome. We could, for example, not roll a six on the first dice, but then we could roll a six on the second dice. And that would mean that on the third dice, we mustn't roll a six. So we have this branch here. And we can see that the sum's going to be the same. It's going to be five six for the first event. I'll just circle that there. It's going to be a sixth for the second event and five six for the third event. So although we're writing five six times one six times five six, that's still the same as a sixth times five six squared. And we already know the answer to that sum is 0 0.11574. Now finally, there's a third way that we can achieve our outcome of just one six. We could not roll a six in our first roll. So we've already highlighted this branch, so I'll go over it again. We could not roll a six on our second roll. And it could be on our third roll that we roll our six. Now hopefully you can see that the sum is going to be exactly the same because we've got 5, 6 times 5, 6. Times a 6 this time, which is the same as a 6 times 5, 6 squared, which we already know is 0 0.11574. Okay, so the probability that we roll a 6 and then two not 6s the probability we roll a 6 and then two not 6s is 0 0.11574. Now the probability that we roll just one 6 and we achieve that on the second roll is a not 6, which is 5 6 here, times a 6 times 5 6, which is also 0 0.11574. And thirdly, the probability that we don't roll that 6 until the final roll, so a 1 through 5, then a 1 through 5, and then a 6 is 5, 6 times 5, 6 times 1, 6. And the probability there is exactly the same. As we said in the previous example, what we need to do is add those three probabilities together. 
And the reason we need to add those three probabilities together is because they're all equally likely. They're three different ways of achieving the same outcome. Okay, so I'm just going to clear a little space in the top right hand corner and we'll look a little more deeply at what we're doing here. Because another way of writing this sum is by writing 3 times 0.11574, which is 0.3472. But what we know is that that is actually 3 times our outcome of a sixth times five sixths squared. So what we're going to do in the next video is we're going to extend this and we're going to look at the probability of achieving any number of outcomes for any number of events by introducing something called the binomial coefficient.